uh, hello again from uh, the United States and, uh, and Ohio. Again, I'm Jeff Miller, uh, Interim Vice President of Workforce Development. Uh, so I also want to echo Dr. Shepard's uh, thanks to uh, the folks here at the uh, Institute of Technology and uh, are certainly our partner at Simlot. Uh, when I was, uh, this is my second trip to Israel. Um, about two years ago is the last time I was here. When I was uh, walking over with uh, your dean, uh, we, were, we were chatting a bit and he asked me if I'd ever spoken to Israeli students before and I said no and I, he kind of moaned a bit and I was scared to ask a follow-up question so I'm not sure what, what that meant so hopefully this will, uh, <laughs> hopefully this will go well. Uh, you know, the other thing I'd like to mention too is, uh, is you heard a little bit about the, uh, at the start of the, uh, uh, the uh, session today about the investment and the importance that the uh, Hellone Institute of Technology is putting on technology. And that's something very much front of mind in the states. We fortunately have had a lot of investment from our president and support and our board of trustees to be able to develop the capabilities that you saw in some of Dr. Shepard's presentation. And I, I think it was exciting to hear some of the work you're doing and the, and the uh, support that you have from the uh, organization and your, 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 uh, uh, tech, your, your institute here to be able to do those kind of things. So very, I would think you'd be very excited as a student that the uh, school is bringing that kind of capability here. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, again, uh, uh, you've, you've seen the vision slide here from Dr. Shepard earlier, but one of the exciting things that we got to be, to participate in last year was with the state of Ohio. They funded some work that we did, uh, six applied research projects in these areas that you see here, and kind of uh, the intent was to uh, assess and understand what was required to utilize UAS for these applications and uh, using commercial off-the-shelf fixed or uh, vertical takeoff platforms uh, and, uh, and also to do that based on the existing FAA regulations. So we didn't want to test things that a commercial entity could never go execute. So we tried to really use what, what was a reasonable platform, sensor package, uh, and fly in a space that a commercial entity would be able to do so. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the, uh, the deliverables or the, the uh, uh, deliverables, yes, that came back on these projects and how they could be useful to folks. Uh, first, I'm going to get you to a video. So even though you might see Dr. Shepard again, I can assure you he is not a movie star in the United States. Really, it's important to test the application of unmanned aerial systems for civil and commercial applications to really learn what's possible. What we try to do in these application uh, pathfinder activities and integrations for commercial uh, application is we say, well, if we know what the application is, what sensor would require that? You know, so is multispectral, infrared, visual spectrum, is it still frame mapping, is it, is it video, or any other combination? And then we say, what kind of aircraft do you need to be able to carry that sensor and accomplish the, the requirements of that application? And that informs what you really go out and test. And so we'll fly the same bridge with various sensors, with various aircraft types, various mission planning software, and we learn something from it. And so you say, well, you know, there's a new uh, panoramic camera that's out that looks interesting. It's $400. Let's put it on top of the quadcopter, fly it under the bridge, and see what we can see. And the answer to that may be, well, we can see more than we thought, or the resolution is not quite as good as we were hoping for, and it's not really useful. You really have multiple stakeholders involved, right? So there's there's the aircraft manufacturers, the sensor manufacturers, they want information about whether their products are meeting the needs of what industry has. You of course have the industry operators, so whatever the site is that you're inspecting, they have a, a use, uh, of course. You have students, right? So the students uh, get to be part of this, they get to go out and participate in the research, but it's also developing uh, jobs, you know, as industry sees the benefit of using UAS and they say, well, I can save money by hiring someone to come out and do this, you're now creating a job that didn't exist before and it's created because it's creating efficiencies in the marketplace and it's adding value. And if you want to go out there into the workforce and get a job flying UAS, you better have some uh, time beyond on the UAS flying the aircraft. So Sinclair is a great place. They have great pilots, they have great instructors, um, they have simulators. You can uh, learn how to fly on, the, on their simulators. Um, you can get some hands-on experience. You can go out to Wilmington Airport, you can go out to Springfield Airport. Um, get your hands on the uh, control, flight controls and learn how to fly them. Sinclair is one of the best places in the country to go to go do that. Using U.S. technology is a great tool of 
assessing conditions of roadways. Another use is for bridge inspection. You know, bridges are constantly deteriorating, are always in a state of deterioration at some level. So using UAS as a tool will make it safer. Motorists want to know that they're driving on safe roads. Um, taxpayers want to know that their dollars are being stretched, and we believe this new technology of UAS will help do both. So, you know, as a community college, uh, we're interested in, of course, uh, serving our local community and, and the state of Ohio and really the country. And so if by virtue of going out and doing these applied commercialization research projects, we're helping that whole group of stakeholders, that's great. So just a, just a back up briefly before I get into telling you a little bit more about each of these applications. So, so you, you may be aware that uh, flying in the U.S. has a lot of, uh, well, it's hard to do, fly U.S. Uh, technology in the, in the United States. So we started to uh, do this back probably in 2012 by following uh, uh, tough FAA guidelines and processes to be able to fly. So initially it was certificates of uh, authorization, COAs. We were the first community college in the United States to get one of those. Then we transitioned to section 333s, uh, which gave you a little bit more access to fly. And now uh, there's a part 107 uh, process that allows us uh, to fly as well. So we've kind of moved through all those as, as we've tried to mature our capabilities at Sinclair. Um, uh, so, uh, so again, our, our uh, capabilities are leveraging what exists today for uh, folks that, that can fly from a commercial perspective. The other thing I would mention too is, is why are we involved in this from a U.S. perspective? So, you know, the United States projects unmanned aerial systems to be a billion dollar industry uh, in, the, uh, in the next 10 years, uh, actually a multi-billion dollar industry, and, and really it's just this regulatory environment and how you fly, and we're, we're trying to do as much as possible and test. That's what all this is about, research and testing, and hopefully uh, when uh, the rules uh, open up a little bit more, we'll be able to do a lot of this activity, which leads to the need to train students. There's certainly, I think I heard comments earlier today too about there's just not one job we're talking about here. There's a whole uh, there, there's many jobs in this space, uh, whether it's you know pilots or data analytics and a lot of things, and we're touching all these spaces at Sinclair presently. Okay, so our first project that we're going to bounce out and talk to talk about here briefly is the pit mine uh, pit mine uh, um, research project we did. So, you know, mining is certainly another industry with many potential UAS applications, including support of acid mine drainage abatement, open pit mine surveying, site safety assessments. Uh, enclosed mine and reclamation studies. So our team that we have on staff, uh, a lot of our folks are on staff and then we subcontract to some people, uh, conducted about 12 flights over a, an Ohio Department of Natural Resource Managed Open Pit Mine. So this kind of uh, captures some of the activities and the uh, uh, data that we were able to get as far as that flight. So this is a picture of our, kind of our Altavian launch, which was our main platform that uh, we used on this. We have a a ground shot of the site and then a uh, aerial view. Uh, then we see some uh, ortho mosaic and terrain maps, a contour map showing rise and fall 3D point cloud, volumetric analysis, ortho mosaic map, 3D model. So, so again, what we're trying to show here is that there is really valuable data that can be uh, captured with UAS technologies that, that ultimately provide advantages to companies or, or uh, uh, you know, in this case, uh, yeah, it could be companies, but provide uh, valuable data at less cost, more efficiently and safer at the end of the day. So in terms of this project, uh, a couple things that we learned, because again, this is research-based projects, so we're trying to figure out what do we learn that can better uh, uh, arm folks in the future to do this? So this was fairly cold days when we did the mine flights. So we saw it had negative impact on flight duration. We saw about a 40% decrease in the amount of loiter time off our VTOL platform that we used when uh, doing this application. And in this case, a fixed wing was, was certainly a better platform to use than a VTOL just due to the space that we're trying to cover when doing this. So next we moved on to a a bridge inspection, again, this is, this is something that is front of mind to, uh, to, men, to the state of Ohio, certainly, and municipalities and, and counties to ensure the, uh, 
the safety uh, of, of critical infrastructure around the country. Engineers use these images to assess existing flaws and model scenarios to determine safety and uh, integration, or integrity, I should say. Uh, some of the initial testing for this occurred in our indoor facility. I think there was a brief shot of that in uh, Dr. Shepard's presentation. We have a 30, roughly a 3,200 square foot, 40 foot high uh, UAS dedicated flying pavilion at Sinclair. And uh, it has exposed infrastructure in there, so it's really good to test, uh, test things in terms of getting ready to go do a bridge inspection. So we were able to do a lot of that in-house before we went out. So what you see here is our GCS that you saw earlier, our uh, Altavian Octocopter that was part of this. And one of the companies that we work with, Altavian, actually was prototyping another platform uh, specifically for infrastructure inspection. So we were able to to bring that on site as part of it, uh, kind of our initial launch. Uh, here you're seeing some uh, 3D modeling of the bridge, ortho mosaic and terrain, uh, high resolution. Uh, on this picture, you can't quite see it on the uh, slide here, but we, we were able to capture some rusting on the bridge that uh, an engineer would certainly want to know about. And then uh, some under bridge inspections that we performed. So some of the takeaways on this were that uh, you know, due to the FAA regulations that I was mentioning earlier, one of the things that you cannot do without a waiver, which we, which we didn't want to seek for these projects, is flying over non-participants. So what that means is that we couldn't just fly over the top of the bridge in the event that there were cars traveling back and forth. So, you know, so these are things that uh, kind of uh, prohibit quick movement of, uh, of where we can go with UAS technology, so we had to be be uh, creative to ensure we adhere to the regulations when we were mapping the bridge. Uh, and then we also noted a, uh, you know, a stable VTOL platform with Nader and Zenith pointing sensors are necessary to get high quality imagery. So certainly on a bridge you can appreciate that it's always not down looking. We have to get, get under and uh, look up at uh, various uh, infrastructure pieces of the bridge. So after that, we uh, did a road inspection. Uh, again, as you can see, these are all critical infrastructure uh, uh, elements were part of this project that was funded by the state of Ohio. So UAS can support both uh, internal site assessments prior to road development, ongoing construction, inspecting existing payments, maintenance operations, a lot of applications here. Uh, this project was done at a controlled Honda test track that is in Ohio that is uh, operated by the Ohio State University. So again, as I was talking a minute ago about you can't just fly over non-participants, not part of what you're doing. Uh, the only way you could really do that on a road would be to have it closed and, and certainly that uh, you know provides uh, or, or uh, has complications to be able to pull that off. So, so the Honda test track is a closed facility so we were able to to get out there and uh, use our, our platforms again. So what you see here is our Altavian Octocopter that we used, uh, one of our partners, uh, our GCS, kind of pre-flight activities going on. Uh, so now we get into some process data that's uh, showing crack severity in terms of the roads and, and you know, the coloring is, uh, uh, I believe, indexed to pavement data that kind of you know, somebody who's a, more of a subject matter expert on this would know how to uh, uh, leverage this and say w what kind of action needs to be taken on this. Uh, 3D models, mosaic and train, and uh, ortho mosaic overlaid on uh, Google Earth. So a couple of the, I would say, takeaways from this was, uh, you know, there were security concerns, unfortunately. I mean, it was fortunate that we were able to get to a controlled road to be able to do this. But since it was a Honda test track, they were sensitive to what images we captured. So before we could just immediately go into data processing, we'd have Honda folks review all the collected data to make sure there wasn't any sensitivity to what was collected. So that kind of stalled our, some of our efforts there. And then, uh, you know, again, as I've commented on uh, earlier, this is one of the things that we report back to the state of Ohio to say, you know, the, the regulatory environment here uh, is a, a prohibiting factor to real, really be able to go out and do just road inspections all the time, really provide value. So hopefully we have more advocates working with us, talking to the FAA to hopefully loosen regulations that uh, allow us to move forward. So next I want to move on to our oil well pad. So again, this, is a, this was an interesting project uh, for a couple different reasons. So the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the EPA 
Environmental Protection Agency is certainly very uh, interested in the impact an oil pad failure could have on the environment. So, so ideally what we, we would want to do is to be able to show how you could use UAS to inspect oil pads or in the event of a uh, failure, kind of what, what kind of economic uh, or environmental impacts there are. Uh, uh, you know, before you send a team in, especially if it's uh, something that there's safety concerns on. So, unfortunately, with this project, there was a lot of, uh, I'll say, uh, uh, security and privacy and, and ultimately, you know, uh, litigation-related issues because of who runs and operates oil pads, so they weren't... Uh, they weren't uh, ready for us to go out and, uh, and collect a bunch of data that may sh show some kind of failure and then that turned into a big headache. So our initial meetings to launch this program had about, I think, 15 lawyers in the room when we first started. And then uh, once we said, okay, we will not collect any data, all the lawyers got up and left and then we were able to figure out a way forward on the project. So, so unfortunately in the project, we were not able to collect data. We could only show live uh, video downlink. But it was still a good exercise, so this is kind of uh, our team deploying on the site. And what we, what we were able to do is, is uh, do a die-release simulation oil spill. So we were able to drop this in a creek that was near the, the uh, oil pad. And just through our video, be able to track and show uh, you know, how the river current was taking it down and, and just briefly start to show how U.S. technology could have an impact in this area. So VTOL platforms also are probably most effective because a lot of these oil pad locations around the state of Ohio are in rough terrain areas to, to get to, so it doesn't really provide a, a, a smooth spot to land a fixed wing uh, uh, platform. Um, it's likely in utilizing infrared imagery or multispectral methane, other gas and atmospheric sensors would probably provide great value to this once the, uh, you know, some of these security and privacy concerns are allayed through uh, you know, continued dialogue. Um, all right, so next we're going to move on. We're kind of, kind of a little bit get out of the infrastructure project, so we're going to talk about uh, airports next. So, so I'm going to I'm going to play another video with our uh, with uh, our, our good Dr. Shepard in it here. But uh, when you think of airports, there's usually two two things that airports are interested in. One is uh, as I'm operating an airport, a lot of people want to fly UAS technology, and how do I let them into my airspace? What are the regulations? A lot of people still are trying to, to understand what the regulations are, even the, the folks that work at airports sometimes, uh, in terms of UAS operations. This project was focused on how, as an airport operator, do I use UAS technology as a tool for me managing my infrastructure as an airport? So kind of a, a, d a different swing on it. So let me play this video, and we'll kind of talk about it briefly. Well, people really, for the last several years, have been looking at the uh, application of unmanned aerial systems for a lot of civil and commercial opportunities. But what a lot of people haven't looked at is the application and benefit of UAS at a airport. And so why do we care about that? Well, you have a lot of utility there. There's a lot of pavement that you need to inspect. So you've got runways and taxiways and aprons and ramps. Uh, we have about 1,800 acres out here uh, in the Springfield-Beckley Municipal Airport. About two-thirds of that is inside the fence. Uh, each day we're required to do an airfield inspection. Uh, so that is everything from pavement inspection to markers and lights and navigational aids. Um, as well as fence line inspection. You also have tenants on the airport, right? So people that have hangars and facilities there, they need to be able to look at their roofs and the sides of their buildings and their HVAC systems and all those types of things. On a more boots on the ground kind of way, uh, to be able to do an aerial inspection of, say, our fuel tanks and fuel facilities, to look at our hydrant facilities, to do a runway inspection. We think that UAS technology is beneficial both to existing tenants as well as fantastic opportunity for prospective tenants. But also we have a facility uh, owned by SpectraJet. It's a Learjet maintenance facility it's contemplating an expansion here. It's going to be a 24,000 square foot expansion of the hangar facility itself, uh, but also the apron. And so recently they were utilizing the UAS uh, to do some pre-survey and inspection of that area. So a local example of how it's being utilized here by one of our tenants. 
Sinclair and its UAS center and UAS offerings is a value add for the Wilmington Air Park in multiple levels as an owner of real estate, as a landlord, and as an economic development agency, which is first and foremost what the Port Authority is. And Sinclair was in, involved with us at the very uh, onset of the UAS activity emerging around the country. So as we're looking at the integration and really the commercial application of UAS at airports specifically, what we're really trying to consider is how can they benefit the airport from uh, time and effort? How can they uh, reduce costs? Uh, how can they add capabilities? Airports exist because they benefit uh, the community, they add to the economy of the local region, and so if you add UAS to it and that's another enabling force, then that's just one more reason to have your airport. Okay, so our airport projects, there were two, two mid-sized airports in Ohio, uh, Springfield Airport and Wilmington Airport that uh, were part of this project. So some of the things that, uh, that we did on, this, uh, on these applications, you heard in the video, but uh, you know, certainly uh, what, what our project was all about was developing tactics and procedures to, to do various inspections around the airport, uh, uh, you know, uh, runways, uh, buildings, taxiways, runway lights, fence lines, all the kind of things that an airport manager is interested in. And we wanted to be able to create uh, a con ops that would support us doing that in the least amount of time possible uh, to, you know, to mitigate uh, airport managers having to take, take runways down or, or just impacting their daily operations. So our target was really being able to do this in one day uh, you know, after we refined all our processes. So, so the first airport here is uh, the Springfield Airport. We're using our fixed wing Altavian platform and, and uh, a VTOL platform to do our work there. Uh, we also used a unique quad. Uh, you're seeing various uh, shots of the airport here. Uh, 3D model of an airport building, uh, a photo of a VOR, and this is actually a 3D rendering of the uh, same, same VOR here. Um, Wilmington, we had, uh, I think this was in the video, we mounted a camera on our, on our uh, uh, Altavian platform, and then we, we also uh, filmed the uh, approach, uh, video of the approach, uh, which our airport folks found uh, very uh, helpful and thought it would be a good thing to use even for pilots who have never approached an airport. They perhaps could watch a video and see what the approach is to an airport. Um, survey of a parked aircraft. This is uh, some various uh, buildings that are on site here, a uh, 3D model of a building. So one of the uh, reasons this was interesting to the uh, Wilmington uh, Air Park folks is they were seeking to lease this facility, so it gave them a tool and a better way to market some of their uh, infrastructure on the, uh, on the airport. Um, 3D uh, ortho mosaic of the runway, the fuel farm that you saw, and then some approach lights inspection. So, so the good news here uh, in terms of the project was we were able to uh, uh, you know, work on this project for, for a few days doing flights and ultimately created a process that we could get in there and, and capture this data in, the, uh, in one day, uh, showing it as a, as a valuable tool to airport managers. So lastly, I want to talk about a, a project that we did with NASA uh, out of Cleveland, NASA Glenn. So our project with NASA was leveraging, uh, you know, how could we use UAS uh, technology to determine the severity of algae bloom uh, uh, in Lake Erie. So that is a, a fairly large body of water, one of the Great Lakes in the United States, and uh, there's uh, you know, a lot of algae issues that, that certainly impact uh, uh, you know, fish and other things negatively. So we're, we're trying to get a handle on that and how could UAS technology perhaps play a role in that. Um, so what we have here is uh, we were able to 3D print a, a, a new sensor housing for an existing platform that we had to integrate a multi-spectral sensor that was developed by NASA specifically for this issue. So. So that was kind of an exciting thing to use some of our 3D printing capabilities and, and our, certainly our, our uh, expertise and in integration to be able to pull this off. So this is, uh, this is our, our guys in the lab integrating the sensor. What you see here are some ground, point, uh, ground control points to calibrate our sensor, a lot of testing before we actually went out to uh, Lake Erie to do this work. 
Uh, again, this is testing that was actually done at the Wilmington Air Park that we were looking at a minute ago before we got on site. Here's, uh, here's our guys uh, with the Nova platform at Lake Erie. We also, uh, this was, I should also say this was in collaboration with the University of Toledo um, Environmental Sciences, I believe. Uh, so they were actually in a boat doing some water sampling, uh, you know, ground truthing, if you will, of uh, what we were going to fly with the UAS. Um, so this is our ground control station, and then we had a little bit of a dicey uh, uh, launching area here due to the, uh, to the location, so that prevented some, uh, some challenges. So one of the things that we were able to do here in terms of success of this, again, was, was our ability to, to 3D print and, and uh, integrate their sensor into our platform. And uh, so, so since NASA was processing the data, we don't, we don't really have a lot of uh, good information, at least uh, from us on that, in terms of uh, the success of that. But, uh, but we hope to do some more of that uh, in the future with NASA. So this is uh, just a last video that I'll show you in terms of our, our landing, which, which was uh, for anybody who actually flies UA, UAS uh, uh, platforms will appreciate this. So we, we weren't able to, to f uh, land this as you would typically do. We kind of had to ch uh, flip around the uh, controllers because you were flying it directly at our, 13, at our pilot. 13, 14, 17, okay, so 18, 19, okay. 20, 21, 21, 22, 17, So as you can see, a tight road here to put this down on in terms of the terrain that's all around here. 17, 17, 16, 15, 14, 14. 14, 13, 14, 13. Good job. Hey. We called that successful. We were happy about that. <laughs> uh, so next steps for us on these pathfinders, fortunately, uh, our, our state, this is also, U.S. technology is also, I should say, a very uh, front of mind initiative for the state and the governor uh, of the state of Ohio, John Kasich, who you may have seen uh, running uh, for president uh, this past <laughs> this past uh, election uh, for the president's uh, job. Um, so we are continuing uh, our airport uh, projects, uh, road inspections. These are continued projects. The ones I just talked to you about are projects that we completed last year, and we're right in the middle of doing a, a second phase of these continued projects. And then uh, due to the, uh, what I think they found is good work, the initial uh, round, they, we have three new research projects that we're doing, power grid inspections, levees and dams, and, uh, and some first responder applications uh, that we're working on, and it ties nicely with uh, some of our work that we're doing with uh, our colleague at uh, Simlot over here. So, so with that, I'm sure we'll want to get on to our third speaker, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to meet with you all today.